everyone, welcome to Simming History, where we look at the history of architecture through the lens of the Sims. Today is the second episode in a mini-series about traditional Japanese architecture, and we are going to look at the Minka, Japan's traditional country folk house. We're going to start with the traditional Japanese Minka. Now, just like every other traditional building, the Minka is a wood timber frame structure, and it sits on a foundation type called Soseki, which are stones laid in a bed of stone or gravel on which the columns of the building sit freely as in they're not fastened the only thing holding this building down is gravity and it may seem counterintuitive but this is actually done because of earthquakes because the building isn't fastened to what will become heaving ground when an earthquake happens the whole building can sort of move on its own accord and when the earth settles, it can settle back down on its soseki and it's largely unharmed. There's also typically no ceiling in a minka, and it's completely open to the beams and rafters above. Which is really great because the beam system is a phenomenal sight to see. The beams are curved. And this seems to be because they use the straight parts of the tree, typically the trunk, four columns, and they used the curvy parts of the tree, perhaps a more curvier trunk, or more likely very large branches, for beams. And it creates this wonderful irregular space up above the living space. And everything here is just held together with rope, and that's to allow for flexibility. Not just for the earthquakes, where it does help, but also for things like high winds. Now the roof of the Minka traditionally would have been thatched with something called pampas grass. It's this hollow reed, and because it's hollow, it provides excellent insulation. And the pampas thatched roofs tend to be several feet thick, and they last about 50 years. And when it's time for them to be replaced, the whole village comes out and provides labor for free. And they do that because they know when it's their turn, the whole village will come out for them. Now the method the pampas grass is installed on the roof is actually really interesting. It's basically sewn onto the roof. Running between the rafters are these poles of bamboo, and on top of the bamboo is like a mat of straw. And through that mat of straw, they basically sew rope using a really giant needle and they sew it around these bunches of pampas grass. And then when it's all tied down, somebody comes along with these giant clippers and clips them so that they're smooth. It's a really fascinating thing to see, and I've included a link in the description down below that'll take you to a video where you can watch it being done. Now the layout of the traditional manga consists of three main parts. There is the doma, which whose floor is of packed earth or stone. It's on the same level as the ground outside. It's the space of the house where you would leave your shoes on. In the case of the traditional minka, it's where you would do chores or there would be work spaces. Um, there also would have been a kitchen. This would have been the warmest space in the house in the winter and the coolest space in the summer. It was actually not uncommon for people to sleep on top of straw in their doma up into the 20th century. The second space is called the hiroma. The hiroma is slightly raised up above the doma and it's a wood planked floor area. And it's where the aurori would have been. The aurori is a sunken fire pit uh, that had a rod going up to the ceiling from which would hang your kettle or your pot and around the Rorori, the family would sit for dinner. Smoke from the Aurori helped keep the roof and timbers dry and insect free. The third space is the Zashiki, or tatami rooms. Not every Minka had Zashiki, but those who did these rooms were only used for formal events or for greeting very important guests. They would not have been used for sleeping or for family functions. This would have been for like weddings or funerals. 
now we're going to look at a subtype of minka called gasho, which is named for their steep roofs. Gasho literally means praying hands, and the steep roofs resemble praying hands. Gasho were, had their heyday during the Edo period into the Meiji period, so ending around 1880s or so. They're found in an area of central Japan that gets a lot of snow. So the traditional minka was adapted to fit that climate. The buildings are built with a north-south orientation so that the two sides of the gabled roof face east-west, which maximizes the amount of sun that they can get, which helps keep, melt the snow and keep the thatch dry. The steepness of the roof also helps keep the heavy snow load off the roof, like feet, 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 and feet, and feet of snow. Like with traditional Minka and every other traditional form of architecture, no nails are used. This is all timber and rope resting on the Saseki foundation stones. Now the layout there are some slight tweaks. Uh, the interior does typically include like a toilet room and an altar, but they are on opposite sides of the house. And the layouts between your house and your neighbor's house would actually alternate so that your toilet is not facing your neighbor's altar and vice versa. The family lives on the first floor. Historically, multiple generations would live in the house with as many as 30 or more people. Just like with the traditional Minka layout, it has a room that has an irori. And that's used to heat the entire home and helps dry out the upper floors. And again, prevents rot and insects. The upper floors in the gasho typically served as storage, but also as primarily working areas such as the keeping of silkworms. Now there's not many gasho left, uh, so few in fact that the two villages that contain the majority of them are both UNESCO World Heritage Sites and have been since 1995. They were listed UNESCO World Heritage because of how rare they are how perfectly adapted they are to their climate, and how it, the gasho and the culture of the people living in those villages have survived despite the vast socioeconomic changes in Japan. Now we're gonna take a look at how Buddhism changed the traditional folk house of Japan. Now, when Buddhism came to Japan, it came from China and it brought with it the Chinese Buddhist temple architecture. And eventually it sort of wormed its way into every aspect of Japanese architecture and country houses were really no different. You started seeing more tile roofs cropping up versus pompous. The benefit of tile, of course, is you don't have to dedicate fields and fields to growing pompous grass just to roof one building. You also began seeing the extended flared eaves that were supported with those complicated beam bracket systems, and it also resulted in the development of a style called shoin. Now shoin literally means writing hall or study, and it dates from a time when commoners started becoming Buddhist monks. Previously, monks had come pretty much solely from the Aristotelic class. And as a result, they could afford to live in all sorts of uh, grand houses. But commoner monks could not afford that. And so a simpler style was born. Features of Shoan include recessed alcoves with shelves and a desk, uh, interior decorated opaque doors called fusuma, tatami mats, beveled square posts, coved or coffered ceilings, shoji doors, and amado, heavy exterior doors that could close at night or during bad weather. Shoen was adopted 
not just by the wealthy and the powerful and the monks, but also by people from all tiers of society. And it pretty much ruled Japanese style for a really long time. Its heyday was during the Edo period, which is the era of feudal Japan. But it persists even today, and it still influences modern architecture in Japan. To quote the book I read primarily for this, that's called The Art of the Architecture. No, it's called The Art of Japanese Architecture. Uh, it says, and I quote about Joanne, it reached a level of perfection in terms of tasteful elegance that has never been surpassed in Japanese architecture. End quote. Now, of course, one of the reasons it became so popular is because it was adopted by the wealthy and the ruling classes, as was Buddhist temple design and residential architecture. These sort of Buddhist farmhouses that start cropping up, cropped up because the wealthy could afford it. The layout of this new type of farmhouse includes a lot of familiar features. There's the Genken which replaced the doma. It's the earthen floor space where you take off your shoes before entering the rest of the house. Except now it's more enclosed. And that's to provide the thermal break between the outside and the inside. We also begin seeing something called Ingawa. Ingawa was a veranda running Ingawa was a veranda running along the perimeter of the house. And it served the purpose of a thermal break. During the summer, uh, the wind, the ingawa could be opened and the shoji panels inside the individual rooms could be opened and it allowed for free air movement through the entire house. Natural air conditioning. In the winter, the ingawa and those, those shoji screens could both be closed and it provided that sort of air gap that would need, be needed to help protect the interior from the home from the bitter cold. On the outside, you also begin to see something called a tubakuru, which is a box for shutters. Sims actually included one, one of these. Now, most people have just been using it as a decorative feature, but the tubakuru serves a really important purpose. During inclement weather, very specifically typhoons, these shutters would be pulled out of the box and enclosed around the entire house to protect the occupants. Now also in this Buddhist farmhouse, we began seeing the tokonoma, which is in addition to the formal guest room. The tokonoma was, has a decorative alcove with a raised platform. They usually contain wall hangings and an ikebana, both, both of which are seasonal, so they'll be changed out with the seasons. And of course, very prevalent in this home is the tatami mat. The tatami mat is actually several inches thick, so if, you, if you've never seen one made, it's, it's several layers of uh, straw and bamboo that has perfectly square edges. They're about two inches thick and they're, they create a very springy floor. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode on the Minka. Let me know in the comment section down below if you have any questions. You can find me on Instagram at Simming History, where I post teasers of upcoming videos when I remember to do so. And at the Sims 4 gallery, well, there will be a playable version of a Minka for all you Simmers. I'll see you next week for part three, the Makia. Until then, bye!